Welcome, everyone. My name's Kevin. And I am Max. And we are here to join you on another deep dive into what we've called vascular diseases of the lung as a general category. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to walk you through a case which we think is a, a very nice example of how pulmonary arterial disease and venous disease can present a difficult challenge diagnostically for pulmonologists, for radiologists, and of course, for pathologists. So Max, tell us about this patient. So this patient is 38, 39 years old at presentation. And she comes into the pulmonologist's office. She has some increasing shortness of breath. She's got an interesting past medical history. A few years back, she was diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma, and she received uh, chemotherapy, radiation therapy for Hodgkin lymphoma. But she's had this sort of progressive, uh, subtly increasing shortness of breath for months, actually. And so she goes to the pulmonologist and uh, undergoes uh, workup at the pulmonologist, uh, transbronchial biopsy, BAL, infectious, all the usual. Uh, and has a CT scan. What's the CT scan show, Kevin? So the CT is reported as showing bilateral ground glass opacities. So when we think ground glass opacities, Max, what are what are you thinking immediately? Yeah. So to to me, uh, you you have this beautiful poster above your right shoulder there, and I'm immediately thinking about alveolar filling or an acute lung injury process, something that is filling those air spaces, changing them from open air spaces, which should be black, to air spaces that are filled with something which shows up on the CT scan as gray or white. Right. right. So when you when when I hear a radiologist say bilateral ground glass opacities, I'm like, okay, let's see the biopsy. Let's find those areas of airspace filling in order to correlate with the radiology. Because like I always say, once you have the radio radiologic correlate on your biopsy, you feel much better as a pathologist understanding, okay, I've got what we're dealing with here and I can make a competent diagnosis. So this would be the kind of case where we're looking at the biopsy here in the background. And I know that uh, those who joined us are also asking themselves, well, this lung tissue looks like it's fairly well aerated. I see a lot of air spaces, the white here, and I'm seeing some small nodules that look pink and some places that look a little reticular like there's some interstitial thickening but this doesn't look like a nsip sort of a cellular interstitial pneumonia or an organizing pneumonia that might produce ground glass so i guess i'm perplexed as i think most pathologists would be on looking at this case at low mag now is there, is there anything else in the history that might be helpful for example I wonder about her pulmonary function studies. She's got ground glass, she's short of breath, and she's probably got abnormalities. And we can explore that in a little bit because that might be helpful in deciphering what the problem is here for this patient. But let's let's get back into our our tissue analysis here. What do you think? Yeah, so so exactly uh, what you just said, Kevin. I mean, this to me, when at at first glance, you know, with your with your fast thinking, you're you're gonna jump directly to this is a normal appearing or normal ish appearing biopsy and despite the radiologic history saying ground glass opacities you're going to go to the poster and you're going to say this is a minimal change biopsy and we've done a couple of videos on minimal change biopsies and we talk about constricted bronchiolitis but this is a great example of one of the other more rare things that you need to think about when you have a minimal change biopsy um, so so we can look around. We'll, we'll, let's get a couple of things out of, out of the way. There's this, uh, which looks almost like a tumor from low power. And so I think we have to uh, put everybody's uh, at, at ease a little bit with what exactly this is. And Kevin? Wow. This is a dramatic example of the lesion that it is, which is a meningothelial hyphen-like nodule. This is a perivenular lesion. So if you look at low magnification, its location is not airway centered. This is a key distinguishing and subtle feature that, that distinguishes you in your knowledge if you understand that if you thought this might be a carcinoid tumorlet, 
or now just tumorlet, which is what directly we'll get these sent in a consultation. They'll be like, Hey, I found a carcinoid tumor, but my neuroendocrine stains are, are not helping me out here. So then we ask, where is it located? And they say, well, you know, it's in the lung. And we say, yeah, but can you take us a little deeper on this? Where is it exactly located? Is it near an airway or an artery? No, it's not. There is near that lesion. And it's out in the periphery. And that's where the veins are most visible. So this is a perivenular, large, jumbo, meningothelial hyphen-like nodule. But probably not this patient's problem, right? But maybe related to the problem, and we'll, we'll speculate about that in a minute. We see meningothelial nodules very often, and oftentimes we just disregard them. Um, but, but remember, they're in biopsies for people who tend to be hypoxic. So that, you know, there's one of the theories is that chronic hypoxia may induce these lesions, but nobody's really proven that. Anyway. Okay, so minimal change biopsy, one of the first things you look for is constrictive bronchiolitis, uh, and we would go through this biopsy and look to see if we can find uh, any airways, of which there actually are not a tremendous number of airways uh, in this biopsy. The which other is thing in and of itself. What's that? Which is interesting in and of itself. Right? Yeah. So we're looking around here. We should have an airway for every artery. And it looks like there's one right there. We have a paucity of airways. There's a little one there. There's a relative paucity of airways. This one that we do see is perfectly normal. Yeah. Uh, but I think one of the issues that we're having with this case is that we're seeing a lot of vascular structures, which in our minds make us think those are pulmonary arteries. Exactly. But the Maybe reality they're not is arteries. these are intralobular post-capillary venules that we're seeing very prominently throughout this biopsy. And that I think is one of the first clues when you're starting down this analysis that you're dealing with this disease process is that we have a whole bunch of cross sections through vascular structures out within the lobule that we typically don't normally see. Yeah, so this is an invisible compartment until it has disease. Exactly, completely invisible. Normally, the only place you see interlobular, um, the, the only place you see pulmonary veins are subplurally or the septa, yeah. interlobular septa. Again, often if they're abnormal because the interlobular septum can be very thin and delicate normally. Not but, a lot of muscle either, right? Right. But we're seeing all of these post-capillary venules um, and they're not entirely normal, are they? No, they're not. In fact, they look like cellular pulmonary arteries. They've, so. This is a fascinating case. This is a great case. Uh, even if you didn't have an answer on this, just to analyze the case the way we're doing it, I think is helpful for the next vascular disease patient you encounter. You know, if you were thinking these are hypercellular pulmonary arteries, right? The ones that are more complex, that have more cells like that one, go to the next, to the, to the closest airway you can find and look at the artery there. And that artery only has some mild thickening of the wall. So we're really not seeing the same degree of abnormality in the pulmonary arteries as we're seeing in the veins. Exactly. We've got a little bit of a disconnect here, right? Yes. In fact, I think we can go, uh, since we're talking about arteries and veins uh, right now, uh, we can quickly jump to this elastic tissue stain, which I think can help uh, distinguish exactly pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins. And here is that structure we were just looking at, right? right? Single elastic layer. This is clearly a pulmonary vein versus our dual elastic layer here within the pulmonary artery. Beautiful. So, and this shows us that that artery is, that artery is not normal. That correct. artery's got a little bit of uh, eccentric subendothelial thickening, huh? Correct. Correct. So a little bit of, of uh, arterial abnormality, dramatic post- um, capillary venular abnormality. And in fact, you would say that these are completely occluded. Yeah. 100% occluded. Amazing. Now, this is an amazing case. And, and you said it, Kevin, you're like, wow, this is a spectacular case. This is the case that you save and you take pictures for a textbook in. Right. Because most of the time, 
if this bi- if this diagnosis is being questioned by somebody, you look at the biopsy and you're like, holy cow, like the changes are so subtle. I'm having trouble even finding pulmonary veins. But right. this is the, the poster child case for what this disease process is. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. And you looked around at the rest of the parenchyma here and you didn't find any evidence of uh, the 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 partner that occurs with pulmonary venoocclusive occlusive disease on occasion, right? Capillary hemangiomatosis. Pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis. There may or may not be another case on pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis, but we did not see that here. So the diagnosis for this, we can stop beating around the bush a little bit. Pulmonary venoocclusive occlusive disease, because we have post-capillary pulmonary veins and venules that are completely occluded. You can use elastic tissue to highlight that. Most people think that pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis and PVOD are part of a spectrum of capillary to post-capillary aberrant blood flow out of the pulmonary parenchyma. Circulation, yeah. Cool. So just as we said that the, the minimal change pattern of constrictive bronchiolitis and vascular diseases like venoocclusive disease can produce ground glass opacities. You see this disconnect between the expectation of what ground glass should look like under the microscope to these two examples, constrictive bronchiolitis and VOD, venoocclusive disease. They, they really are two great poster children of the disconnect between radiology and pathology trying to explain the presence of ground glass abnormalities. Absolutely. And I think if you, if you learn nothing else from this video, if you remember that if a patient presents with imaging showing ground glass and you have a biopsy that shows minimal change, there are two things really that you need to think about primarily. Constrictive bronchiolitis or pulmonary venoocclusive disease. And the third thing is Maybe they missed the lesion. Or a cystic disease. Like it could be a subtle lamb, you know, where you look at it low mag and you say, boy, I'm not seeing very much, but there are a few collapsed lamb cysts in the lung. But hopefully the C, the hopefully if you have imaging on that, it'll say there's bilateral cysts in addition to the patchy ground glass, and you'll say, okay, no, no problem. But I think exactly. really these two, constrictive bronchiolitis, PBOD, um, that's a great take on that. That could be another pearl you can put in your back pocket. Very nice. Very nice, Max. Okay. I right. well, uh, hope you guys enjoyed this case of pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. I uh, hope you're enjoying the, the new format. And uh, don't forget to like and comment below and let us know what you think. Thanks a lot.